Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, our state of emergency continues. Tens of thousands of firefighters on the front line of wildfires burning across our dry state. How the weather may quench or flare the hot tinderbox. And I'm Peggy Pico. How San Diego Unified School District is helping families prepare for California's new stricter immunization requirement before it takes effect next year. What parents need to know now. Also ahead, why Rancho Santa Fe water savers got a big payout from turf removal rebates, why so many rebate programs are tapped out, and what to do if you still need to replace your turf. The moment we came around the bend, I could hear the bombs going off, I could see the ships blowing up. Powerful memories from the date that would live in infamy. San Diego veterans share their stories as the nation marks the end of World War II. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Fire crews in California are stepping up their attack against wildfires. Firefighters are gaining the upper hand on a large fire burning in the Napa wine country. The Jerusalem fire burned more than 25,000 acres since it first started a week ago. More than 13,000 firefighters are battling 19 active wildfires across the Golden State. As Associated Press reporter Sandy Cozell explains, firefighters in California and beyond are banking on calmer weather to help with the firefight. Firefighters across the West are hoping for a second day of calmer weather on Monday as they battle huge blazes in a number of states. Fires in central Washington state have destroyed more than 50 homes and other structures. Crews are lighting backfires to burn away dry brush and keep the fires at bay. We were kind of defense mode trying to save structures. Firefighters and residents are also busy battling blazes in eastern Washington. Officials in Stevens County say conditions are treacherous. Everything that can be done now is being done out there and our first priority is protecting people and homes and structures. Our state's resources are stretched so thin, so it's just up to us to defend our own property. And that's what people do. People come together and help you defend what's yours. And all they expect in return is that you would do that for them. A massive fire is burning close to the Oregon-Idaho border. It's called the Soda Fire, and it's burned more than 440 square miles. Idaho's governor issued a disaster declaration for at least one county. And a number of major fires are affecting California. Crews are battling huge blazes in the northern, central, and southern parts of the state. Sandy Kozell, the Associated Press. A collision in mid-air over the weekend near Otay Mesa left five people dead and federal investigators searching for clues as to what caused it. The two aircraft collided on approach to Brownfield Municipal Airport, sparking several small fires and littering a nearby field with pieces of aircraft. Just picking up the wreckage, we're looking at parts, documenting, making sure we have everything on scene. And we're going to get it recovered today to Phoenix, Arizona, where we'll do a wreckage layout and possibly look at some impact marks that'll tell us a, and maybe an attitude of how the airplanes collided. One of the victims was a contract employee with the military contracting company which leased the aircraft. Firefighters from San Diego, Chula Vista and Cal Fire worked on the crash aftermath and small ensuing brush fires. San Diego Spanish speakers can now receive live emergency notifications in their native language. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero says the county launched Spanish versions of its emergency app and website today. Both the app and the website stream information about ongoing emergencies such as fires, floods and earthquakes. They also include survival guides on how to prepare for and recover from those disasters. County officials say about 350,000 San Diego County residents speak only Spanish. I want to make sure that our Spanish-speaking population uh, gets the real life-saving information that they need during an emergency situation. Nearly 170,000 people have downloaded the English version of the app. I spoke to Marta Cano, a 57-year-old Chula Vista resident who speaks mostly Spanish and plans to use the new version. Of course, of course, I'm going to use it because it's a benefit for everyone, for the community even. 
because people who send me who don't know how to use the app, I can help them. I can tell them when there's a fire. The app is called SD Emergency, with an option to view in English or Spanish. The website is listosandiego.org. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. L.A. Bound, the point man behind a new stadium for the San Diego Chargers and the Oakland Raiders, says both teams can guarantee success in the Los Angeles market. Carmen Policy showed off some of his NFL presentation today to L.A. leaders. According to the Orange County Register, he says Carson is the future home for both teams because it's the best football location in L.A. He also says the Carson Stadium creates a mega market in Southern California. A new $5 million initiative is being launched in an effort to fight heroin use and trafficking, especially on the East Coast. About half of the money will be used to fund a program to link law enforcement agencies and public health with the goal of making treatment for the drug a priority over punishment. The announcement today reflects a significant spike in heroin use and deaths across the country. Between 2002 and 2013, heroin-related deaths from overdose quadrupled in the U.S. A new study suggests higher densities of medical marijuana shops are associated with more drug-related hospitalizations. From our North County Bureau, KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg says the study relied on data collected in California. Researchers examined the number of hospitalizations for marijuana abuse by California zip code. They also tabulated the quantity of dispensaries per square mile by zip code. Each additional pot store was associated with a 6.8 percent increase in the number of pot-related hospitalizations. Previous studies have shown higher densities of alcohol outlets are associated with more alcohol-related health problems. In addition, drug abuse prevention experts say medical marijuana dispensaries sell very strong products. The study does not say that a higher density of pot shops causes more hospitalizations. It merely suggests there's a link between the two. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. It's back to school season, and as Peggy Pico finds out, San Diego Unified is urging parents to make sure their kids get their shots before class starts. San Diego Unified School District has a no shots, no school policy that requires proof of immunization or documented exemption. But come next year, California's new vaccine law eliminates the personal belief exemption, meaning kids in public and private schools will need to be up to date on their vaccines to attend class. Here with more on how the district is preparing to implement the controversial law are my guest, SD Unified's nursing and wellness manager, Michelle Bell, and UC San Diego professor and pediatrician Dr. Mark Sawyer. And Michelle, according to KPBS news partner iNewsource data, about 8% of San Diego County's uh, kindergartners last year were not vaccinated uh, at the start of the year. So what are the immunization requirements for K through 12 students in public schools? So the requirements are polio. They have to have four doses of polio. They have to have diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, four doses of that. Uh, two doses of measles, mumps, and rubella, and for the older kids, uh, for the younger kids, hepatitis B, and then varicella. So kindergartners coming in would mm -hmm. need those last two. Oh, what is the district doing to prepare parents uh, for the new vaccine law? So the nurses will be talking to all of our parents at registrations and back to school nights about what the new law is and when it goes into effect. And for those families that want to do the personal belief waivers for this uh, academic school year, they'll have until December to, to apply. So uh, the, the, just to be, sh to be clear, the new vaccine law goes into effect fall of 2016, a year from now. Uh, what about grandfathering kids in as they're going to be the kindergartners, let's say, or the, the students, maybe even third graders that uh, have had personal exemptions? Will they still have to be vaccinated? They'll be grandfathered in until they reach their next immunization, immunization cycle. So if there's a third grader who's starting this year when they enter seventh grade, they'll have to have proof of vaccinations. If they were on personal uh -huh. exemption. If they were a personal belief waiver. I see. Now, Dr. Sawyer, you work with the county's immunization registry. What does San Diego County's registry tell us about how many kids are not vaccinated? Well, the registry is not the best way to really figure that out because not all kids are in the registry. So the data that you've been looking at on the school uh, website is probably the most accurate because every year each school has to report the percent of children who are unimmunized. But what has physicians concerned and ultimately led to this new law is the rate of these exemptions has been gradually going up over the last decade. And it's reaching a threshold where we are going to see outbreaks of disease. 
And um, last December, speaking of that measles outbreak that started at Disneyland, about 147 people were infected. Now, many of those were not immunized, but some were. So uh, how effective are vaccines and uh, what can happen if these vaccination rates aren't met, as you were talking about? Yeah, that's a very good point to, to discuss. So measles vaccine is actually among our most effective vaccines. With a single dose, about 95% of people are immune, and with two doses, it goes up to 98. But it never makes it to 100%. So even people who are immunized may get wrapped up when an outbreak gets started, like the Disneyland outbreak. And that's important for parents to know. That's one of the reasons for this bill, is that we keep these diseases out of school so that they never get a chance to get hold. What do you tell parents, though, that, speaking of these personal exemption beliefs, that, that are concerned about vaccine safety? Well, my opinion is that parents who choose not to immunize their children are doing so because they haven't received accurate information. There is lots of information available on the Internet. Some of it's excellent. Some of it is actually very bad and, frankly, wrong. So my advice to parents is not to rely on the Internet, but talk to their health care provider about the risks and the benefits of vaccines. When you get the right information, a parent is going to choose to immunize every time. Do you think that this new law will actually help dispel the myths about vaccines? Well, I'm hopeful that it will. I'm sure some people will still resist this, uh, the information that's available. But the science is very clear that vaccines are safe and the risk from the vaccine, although never zero, is much lower than the risk of the disease. And Michelle, what about medical exemptions? If you could briefly tell us what that is and what happens to students at school that are under medical exemption. So with the medical exemptions, we do exactly the same thing. We make sure that they're on record. We have a database. We know who those families are. Um, there's only very few of our students who have medical exemptions, and it's usually for immunosuppressant-type illnesses. So it's, it's very it's rare. It's very rare. All righty. Well, I want to thank you, Michelle Bell and Dr. Mark Sawyer. Thank you so much for the update. And I want to let folks know that San Diego Unified is hosting an immunization clinic at Bell Middle School next Thursday, August 27th, from 7.30 a.m. until noon. San Diegans have been marking the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. The conflict transformed the city from a sleepy border town to a military metropolis. The Army was here, you had, you know, Camp Kearney, you had all kinds of Army bases, coast artillery that was here. You had barrage balloons in the park over San Diego. You had aircraft, anti-aircraft stations built up here on the hills around Balboa Park. San Diego veterans have been sharing their memories from the war. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy talked with some members of what's been called the greatest generation. Well, here's a, quite a large piece of the USS Arizona right here. Jesse Thompson was 13 years old and just feet away from the USS Arizona when it was bombed in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Boom, boom. I heard it. So I ran out, my pajamas out in the backyard, and I swear... That's where the battleships were. The son of a naval officer, Thompson was put to work for the next three days loading machine gun belts. Seventy years later, his spacious Benita home is filled with memorabilia from that tragic day and the battles that followed in World War II, many pieces given to him by veterans. This sand was stolen from the Japanese on the island of Iwo Jima. And on this day, like every Wednesday for the past two decades, his home is also filled with living history. World War II veterans who fought courageously to change the world. The group typically shares war stories, eats lunch, and enjoys an old-time movie. I was a 19-year-old brat that grew up overnight when the attack took place on Pearl Harbor. Stu Headley attends the regular meetings. He was on board the battleship West Virginia when it was struck by torpedoes. Fire was three times as high as this house from the oil that was burning. He recalls escaping the ship by jumping into the burning sea and swimming beneath the flames. We d went as deep as we could and swam underwater. We broke surface twice, and that's the hottest breath of air we ever breathe. For Headley, the room of war mementos and photos bring back vivid memories. The walls provide a safe haven to those who endured some of America's fiercest battles to share their experiences.
Headley hasn't always eagerly recounted the momentous fight. Even his wife was unaware of his involvement in Pearl Harbor until their 25th wedding anniversary when they toured the Hawaiian coast. The moment we came around the bend, I could hear the bombs going off. I could see the ships blowing up. It was all replayed in my, and my wife asked me, Butch, what's wrong with you? I says, honey, I never told you this before, but I was here on December the 7th on one of the battleships along Battleship Row. Now the 93-year-old takes every opportunity to share his experience. August 14th, 1945, I was aboard the USS Massey. He's one of dozens of veterans in San Diego, captivating audiences this month with first-hand accounts of the end of World War II. On this day, he's at the Veterans Museum in Balboa Park with 200 friends. They hold a bond seven decades strong. Their hats, shirts, and badges show their years of service. I've never felt that way before. Bill Reidenauer served in the Army and was in the Bay of Tokyo when President Harry Truman announced Announced Japan's unconditional surrender. The war to which we have devoted all the resources and all the energy of our country for more than three and a half years has now produced total victory over all our enemies. It was the best day of my life. It was like the last hurrah that I felt. It was all so happy and, and thankful. Bobby Morris was a ship-to-shore Morse code operator in the Navy. You know that statue, the kiss? I can understand that picture because actually it happened to me, same thing. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you were not safe on the streets. <laughs> Navy veteran Randy Tidmore was stationed in San Diego on August 14th. Her job was to unload luggage when troops returned from overseas. She says San Diego went crazy. And they said... You women in the barracks, don't go downtown. Those Navy boys will, uh, will, are going wild. So. The lights went on all over the world. When Thank you. The lights again, here I am right here, and I'm 17. Back in Benita at Jesse Thompson's house, he holds up a large framed picture of himself celebrating the end of the war among a crowd gathered at Horton Square. An occasion that everyone just felt great. They were hugging each other, kissing each other. An outpouring of joy that echoed through the streets of San Diego and across the world. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. The final permit to drill for oil in the Arctic Ocean was granted today by the government Royal Dutch Shell. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement approved the permit to drill below the ocean floor off Alaska's northwest coast for the first time in more than 20 years. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that U.S. Arctic waters hold 26 billion barrels of recoverable oil. Shell hopes to drill two exploration wells during the 2015 open water season. It has until late September when all work must be done. California law aimed at creating clean energy jobs has failed to meet expectations. Voters approved it in 2012 to raise taxes on corporations and generate thousands of clean energy jobs. The Associated Press says barely one-tenth of the promised jobs have been created. Another concern? There is no comprehensive list to show how much work has been done or how much energy has been saved. Following up drought rebates, we first told you about the San Diego homeowners who received big checks for ripping out their lawns last week. Now, Peggy Pico takes a look at what's next for the program that's run out of cash. Individual participants in Rancho Santa Fe received up to $70,000 in rebates through the Metropolitan Water District's Cash for Grass program, says a UT report that also confirmed the MWD's $340 million rebate fund was spent in just one year. Here with details and tips on tapping into rebate programs are Gordon Hess with the Independent Rates Oversight Committee for the City and County's Public Utilities and Dennis Cushman, Assistant General Manager for San Diego County's Water Authority. And Gordon, you brought up concerns about the uh, Metropolitan Water District's turf rebate, rebate program last May. What are major concerns in this program? What are they for you? Well, there was a couple of concerns. One is the massive amount of money that uh, was being contemplated on, on the program. At that particular time, it was $150 million. Now it's turned into $450 million. The other concern I had was an oversight of the program, verification that the money is well spent. 
And uh, speaking of which, Dennis, people in Rancho Santa Fe got a big chunk of this year's rebate funds. Um, but that wealthy community was actually criticized for heavy water use, and now their water use, I understand, has dropped about 30 to 40 percent. So does that mean this turf rebate program has actually worked? Well, I don't, I don't know that the Santa Fe Irrigation District would attribute that kind of conservation to turf replacement. Uh, turf replacement has sort of an unproven past in terms of how much is conserved, and certainly soon after you replace it, you, you, you don't save much money because you've got to establish new plants. I think the success that they've had in the Santa Fe Irrigation District throughout their community is on the outreach the district has done, the two days per week watering limit, which is in effect throughout almost all of San Diego County, uh, and communication with their with their ratepayers who have rallied uh, around uh, the district, as have all San Diegans on conserving water. Let me ask uh, Gordon though about this turf uh, rebate program. So, is there any sort of follow up when somebody has applied for a rebate program? They take a picture, they get their money back. So, uh, what's the what's the oversight? What's the follow up once that check has been issued? Well, I don't think there is any any oversight for the residential program. Uh, you send in pictures initially, they approve your program. You send in pictures when you're done, and they send you a check. So uh, they, they really do need to have at least some spot checking to make sure that uh, these turf areas are being replaced and, and water is being saved. One know? question that's come up is should these rebate programs have a cap that each individual can only get so much uh, from a rebate program? Well, certainly I would like to see a cap, and I think they've implemented some caps now. But the majority of the rebates that they gave, because they gave them after people had applied, and so there was a cutoff date. Those that applied before the cutoff date, there was no cap. So, All right. And yeah. let me ask Dennis, getting back to the MWD's uh, program, uh, you had some concerns with the, that program as well. What are those? Well, uh, similar to what Gordon is talking about, they're, they're simply not a rigorous uh, control of ratepayer money. Uh, they, they created a frenzy of people lined up to submit for the rebates. They don't require receipts. Uh, e e even now, today, they only require receipts if the project's over $100,000. So they don't require any receipts. Um, our program that we operate until January of this year uh, had very rigorous controls in place, verification, uh, measurements, uh, plant material approval in advance, and none of the rebate money could be used for labor. It was only for uh, materials, and it could not exceed the cost of the materials. None of those controls are in place for the MET program. So that brings me to you, Gordon. <clears throat> um, do you have any tips that you would like to see implemented for managing these uh, rebate programs more effectively? Well, I, I think these types of controls that Dennis talked about that the Water Authority uh, apparently has on their program, I think that's a good start. But I think one control they really ought to think about is the massive amount of spending. I would like to see, rather than spending all that money on turf rebates, that perhaps they consider rebates to the ratepayers that gave that program or to the water districts or the cities so that we could manage our own programs, say at the city of San Diego. I see. We're going to have to end on this, and I'll start with you, Gordon, and then I'll come to you, Dennis. Low-cost tips for replacing turf or other thirsty plants that are still available today. Any rebate programs, any tips that you have? Oh, um, I, I would say get educated and put in the right types of plants so that you are going to save water in the long term. And Dennis, how about you? Is there a place people can find out? Yes, if they go to our website, whenindrought.org, that we set up as a clearinghouse of information for conservation programs and other incentives that are still available, even though uh, turf replacement rebates are not, not presently available. Sure, rain barrels for sure. I know that. Dennis Cushman and Gordon Hess, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Peggy. you. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next News Hour, Rethinking College. We kick off a week long series on innovative approaches to improve higher education. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Standing proud after the big win, the Sweetwater Valley Little League is heading to the Little League World Series. They beat out a team from Hawaii. They now face off against the Great Lakes champion in the first round of games this Thursday. Sweetwater Valley is the 11th local team to qualify for the series. Ready, set, jump. The pier jump is one of the most anticipated events of the Junior Lifeguard Program, and it happened today at the Ocean Beach Pier. After a photo op, the group braced themselves and took the plunge. The Junior Lifeguard Program is for children and young adults who want to be lifeguards. 
It's yeah. intimidating, but it's worth it. A lot of adrenaline yeah. pumping. What do you guys think of the program? It's the um, best summer program there is for sure. Yeah. We're in the water 24-7, and it's awesome. The junior lifeguards learn swimming and water rescue skills as well as CPR. It's important to note that it is, in fact, against the law to jump off of the pier. The weekend heat wave kept San Diego lifeguards busy. New numbers from San Diego Fire Rescue show more than 340,000 people visited San Diego beaches on Saturday and Sunday. At least 142 incidents were calls for medical aid. Lifeguards conducted 51 rescues over the weekend. Expecting some relief from the heat in San Diego, it's looking overcast by the beaches with 70s. Warmer in the inland valleys with 80s, and it'll be breezy in the mountains tomorrow with 80s. Still feeling hot in the desert with triple digits with a high of 111 degrees. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Midday Edition, a closer look at aging doctors. San Diego's medical establishment works to set guidelines for senior doctors. That's tomorrow at noon on KPBS Radio. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.